What's up, everybody? Brothers, sisters, psychonauts, and seekers of truth, it is Anonka, and welcome to my bazaar. Today, I'm going to be reading a Mad Honey trip report. The title of this trip report is Dizziness, Nausea, and General Weakness, and was submitted to Eroid in 2018 by the user Michael T. With all that being said, let our story begin. Hallucinogenic, honey. Hey, I think it kicked me a little. Are you okay? I'm fucked. Haven't made it back yet. Man, I'm so fucked. On my bed. Can't move. I hope to make it home. I can't see anything. Fever. Yup. Good shit. Take care, dude. I'm sweating like a dog. Any advice? I am lying on my bed, naked. There is a bucket of spew and cum next to me. I only have 10% vision. I blindly force-feed myself from the half-packet of dried pasta that's piled up on my chest. Not the best time to be having a low blood sugar episode. My phone makes a noise. I run my hand over the sheets next to me, searching for it. It's a message from my Chilean friend, Nicholas. It's a long and drawn-out voice message with lots of gaps. Hey, dude. Did you reach your hostel? Er, I will try to vomit to feel better. I'm very fucked up. Rookie error. We should have listened to the medicine man. We should have only had the recommended half teaspoon dose. Instead, we had four and a half teaspoons. I know, I know. Let's just say we took one for the team. And hopefully, our experience will educate any other travelers wishing to indulge on the hallucinogenic honey harvested deep in the forest of the Annapurna Himalayan mountain range. It's all Nicholas's fault anyways. That fucker was the one who introduced me to the idea on our bus ride to Pakora. Hallucinogenic honey man, made by the largest honeybees in the world. They pollinate the rhododendron flower, and it fucks you up. He said. Vice even did a piece on it. I thought, fuck off, you crazy tortilla-eating gringo. You are about as likely to find that as you are to pass through Australian customs. Three days we search. We ask. We fail. Nicholas leaves to track the Annapurna circuit, and I choose to do nothing. Justifying to myself, that I am providing space for creativity. Then it all went down. I find myself sitting in a small dwelling, the rain bouncing off the tarpaulin roof held together with sticks and rope. All I was after was some cracked pepper and Himalayan rock salt for my bloody scrambled eggs. But here I am, inspecting this mummified caterpillar whose body gets taken over by a fungus, which then grows from the dead animal's mouth. On the floor lie small sacks of various medicinal herbs. This old Russian lady begins to hit on me. Instead of listening to her, I proceed to have a conversation with myself, weighing up the idea of pursuing what could be another interesting story for the boys. Do you want the taste of Russia, Michael? Well, I have never been a huge fan of beef stroganoff, but maybe a small sample could suffice. She could stroke Yornov. She could also probably beat me in an arm wrestle by the looks of it. I mentioned medicine for my type 1 diabetes, and before I know it, she is leading me by the hand down an alleyway to a practicing shaman and Ayurvedic specialist. Enter Ngima Sherpa. Playing the role perfectly, this thin Nepali man 
is sitting cross-legged in his courtyard, making rope incense out of rice paper. I ask him how the medicinal properties of the plants, native only to the surrounding area of his village, are discovered or identified. Visions and dreams, it seems, have caused men to wander far into the forest in search of their cure. Sounds legit to me. As we walk, he strokes the few long wisps of hair that hang from his chin. Mountain honey, he informs me, is an anti-diabetic agent and an aphrodisiac. Great. Two priorities in my life taken care of at once. Balanced blood sugar levels and a rocking hard boner to go with it. He has just the stuff. Half a teaspoon, he says. I get ten teaspoons worth of the hallucinogenic honey, dubbed Mad Honey, and make my way back to my room. Nicholas returns a few days later. It's 4.30 p.m., and we take a one and a half teaspoon hit. After all, there's no point beating around the bush, as we say in Australia. Sitting on the balcony in silence, a half hour passes by. We feel nothing, so we take another spoon. Another half hour, another spoon. As you can tell, both Nicholas and I are definitely, without a doubt, experienced recreational drug users with years of psychedelic experimentation under our belt. Alas, this is not the case. We give up on the honey and decide to go for a walk. But why not have one final teaspoon? One for the road. After all, it's a dud batch, yeah? It is 6.30 p.m. We are downtown Pecora, and my tongue starts to feel numb. Nicholas feels normal and wants to go walk about, but I think it is best for me to start making my way back. We split. I get 30 meters down the road and begin to feel dizziness, nausea, and general weakness. My vision begins to distort, and I am like, fuck, my bed is ages away. Michael, Michael, oi. To my right are some Aussies I met a few days earlier. They are calling me from the balcony of a Vietnamese restaurant. I make my way up, resting on the stairs, trying to gather myself. My vision is currently sitting at near 50%, and my body is heating up. I sit down next to them with a feeling of relief. Familiar faces and a safer environment for me to wig out in than the gutter of a third world country. I explain to them the situation, and they continue to check in on me throughout the course of their meal. I wonder what Nicholas is up to. I can't contact him, though, because I can't see shit. My vision is like that of a kaleidoscope, or light reflecting through shattered glass. Blackness comes and goes as I sit inebriated. My involvement in the conversation goes something like this. How you doing over there, man? Well, I'm currently blind and need to pee. I giggle in their general direction. But apart from that, I'm all G. Although, in all seriousness, I was wigging out a bit. I had experienced this type of tunnel vision in the past. Four years ago, when I took a hit of some chronic weed. Ten minutes later, I blacked out, fell back into a fridge, had a mini seizure, and woke up to my mate slapping me in the face. Sounds worse than it was but I self-diagnosed it as syncope, a temporary loss of consciousness that most often occurs when blood pressure is too low, hypotension, and the heart doesn't pump enough oxygen to the brain. I was expecting at any moment to wake up on my back after another seizure-like fainting episode, trying to convince everyone that I am fine. I just focused on my breath, and accepted that this was the ride I was on. 
It was now 8 p.m. and the group were heading off. I cannot thank these guys enough. I would have been in a sticky situation without them. They walked me to the main road and hailed a taxi. I had my hands on Ryan's shoulders. Like a blind man, I followed his footsteps, managing to cork my thigh on the taxi bonnet whilst trying to get in front of the door. What a mess. My taxi drops me close to my guest house. It's not close enough, though. It's a 200-meter walk up a slightly inclined, dark alleyway. I have very few options right now. I am blind, and my body doesn't want to work. I take five small steps before having to lean against a wall to keep from fainting. It's a long walk home. I stop after every five steps and take ten deep breaths, coaching myself to just keep moving forward. I am not worried. I am not scared. A little disappointed in myself but that's okay. I entertain the idea of just curling up in the cornfields to my left and fetal positioning the night away. On my hands and knees, I crawl up to my guest house stairs. My vision comes and goes as I feel for the keyhole to my room. I'm in. I feel sick and vomit into my rubbish bin. Immediately, I feel much better and send Nicholas a message encouraging him to do the same. I close my eyes with fingers crossed that I wake up in the morning. Morning comes, and I feel fine. A little wobbly, but fine. I message Nicholas. You still alive? He replies. Yes, you. Further research since has revealed to me that symptoms from the honey appear anywhere between 30 minutes to 4 hours after consumption. What we experienced was mad honey poisoning, not intoxication. The signs and symptoms can seem life-threatening, but are rarely fatal. The word rarely doesn't give me much relief, but hopefully this reflection of our experience helps some poor bastard out there to not make the same mistake. Remember, one half to one teaspoon max, boys and girls. Cheers, Vice. All right, everyone. That is the end of our story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Share with us your Mad Honey experiences down in the comments below. Check out the other videos and playlists on my channel, and I will see you in the next one, fam. Deuces.